Michael Morton spent 25 years in a prison in Texas serving for the murder of his wife, a crime he did not commit. In 2011, he was exonerated with help from people at the Innocence Project, uh, from new DNA evidence that came to light. And now, as you heard there, he's committed his life to making sure this doesn't happen to anyone else. Ladies and gentlemen, Michael Morton. Hey, Willie. Uh, center. Right there. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Michael, so I, I, I've dug into this case. I've looked at it. There was, there was no physical evidence. There was no credible alibi. How did you get convicted? I think it was probably a combination of um, bad actors, um, bad luck, and um, less than scrupulous officials, honestly. Yeah. And what do you think their motives were? There's a prosecutor in this case that we'll talk about who has since been disciplined and, and stripped of his power. What motivated him? Why do you think he did this to an innocent man? I've wanted to ask him that, but I haven't had the opportunity. But, um, you know, we, we, we game things in our head a lot. We think about why. Because the most important question, I think, in all of our lives is why. And I think it was partly um, ambition and hubris and a bit of moral corruption. Because it's very easy, I think, to take that first small step to bend a rule or cut a corner, no matter what the field it is. And the second time, it's a little easier and a little easier. Mm -hmm. And before you know it, you're in over your head. You've said you got home from work that day in 1986, and you felt almost immediately that the sheriff and the people on the scene had made up their mind mm -hmm. that you committed this crime. What's that feeling like? Ooh. Um, It's totally alien. It's like stepping into a, a different country where they speak a different language and the Moors are different. Um, they have procedures you don't understand. The, you, you're, you're at their mercy. And um, you may have allies on your side, but they have the power of the state. And that can sometimes be almost limitless. So then what is it like, Michael, to sit in that courtroom knowing you had nothing to do with this crime? You've lost your wife, by the way. You're grieving through that. And to hear this story now being concocted out of whole cloth, how do you sit there and process that? I think a little bit of it was um, the male attribute sometimes of compartmentalization. You, you, you break your life in little bitty pieces and small things that are manageable that you think you can do. Because on hold, it'll crush you. But um, I was like a naive high school kid right out of a civics class. I thought that this process would work out. They would see that these were emotional pleas. And um, in short, I didn't think I'd get convicted. And when that verdict comes down? Um, it's a, uh, of course, it's an emotional blow but it's also physical. I mean, it was like I got punched in the gut. I collapsed and I fell into the chair. Um, it's like you hear this ringing in your ears and uh, it's very much like being hit uh, unexpectedly right in the face. You're numb, you're not sure, and you're just looking around trying to get your bearings. So in a relatively short space of time, you go from husband and father, you had a three-year-old son at the time, to inmate. You walk into prison for the first day. What's it like in there for you? I shouldn't smile, but um, <clears throat> I got some really good advice from an old con when I was in county jail before we went down. And he said, I was lucky in a weird sort of way because I was 32 years old. That makes me a grown man. I know who I am. And he said at first, keep your mouth shut and your eyes open because it's a um, bizarre subculture. That stuff you see on TV in the movies, no, nah, it's not like that. It's uh, grinding, repetitive, boring, frighteningly violent sometimes, but usually just 
soul crushing with its repetition. Mm. It's the grayness of the days and the years. Did the other inmates know who you were? Had they been paying attention to this case? One or two did, but not to put too fine a point on it, but the, um, the so-called average prisoner is not that well informed. They wouldn't care who you were. No, <laughs> and it doesn't matter that I was innocent. Um, every person that goes in there has to put up with the same stuff. The food, the clothes, the people. Um, your innocence or guilt is irrelevant. The state's going to do what the state's going to do, whether you live or die, and you just have to adapt. I know you continued to fight for a long time. You knew you hadn't done this. Was there a point, though, along that stretch of 25 years where you gave up hope and you said, I've been here five years now. I've been here 10 years. I've been here 20 years. This isn't going to happen for me. I guess I'm a little bit of a slow learner. It didn't happen until <laughs> I was about 14 years in. But I hit a low point when my son was legally adopted, legally changed his name, and that's what broke me. And that's when I figured this is, this is it, it's the end. You said he came in at 12 years old before that and said, Dad, I can't come anymore. I can't come see you. That was the first low point. And then when he tells you he's going to be adopted and change his last name, it broke you. Yeah, there were a lot of things in my life that hadn't broken me. but. Um, whether it was cumulative or if that was just the very worst, parent losing a child, uh, that's when I uncharacteristically just realized that I had nothing left and nowhere to go. And um, unlike my normal self, I just cried out to God. Mm. And because, you know, I got nothing here, show me something. And I um, figuratively and literally saw the light. And um, everything didn't change like that. I spent another decade inside, but um, inside, uh, I started seeing everything differently. Everything. Like what? What do you mean? Um, that my personal situation wasn't the most important thing in the world. It was how I reacted to it. It was how I um, saw the big picture of life. What's important? Is it um, that we're basically not good people, or is it, what are you going to do about it? And uh, once you change that inside of a person, everything else changes. We can have all the programs in the world that will change outward behavior, but until you try to change the inner person, um, everything else is superficial. So that light goes on inside you, but if you're going to get out of that prison, you need some help oh, yes. from the outside. Where did that lifeline come from? Amazingly, one of my attorneys at trial, and I had good attorneys. They weren't state-appointed second-tier lawyers. They were good. But one of them just happened to be a friend of a guy named Barry Sheck. Their wives knew each other. They visited one another in the summertime. And Barry and his friend Peter started the Innocence Project. And my attorney at trial asked if they would take my case. And that wasn't an inside deal. He didn't just take over my case. He took my file and stuck it at the bottom of the stack. And I had to work my way up like everybody else. And the Instance Project has a lot of people pleading for their assistance. And um, you have to not only be actually innocent, you have to be lucky enough to have the physical evidence and the preserved record that will facilitate them jumping in and helping you. And there was a preserved record. And th that's one of the most shocking things about this case. There was a very clear record that was not presented at trial, that the sheriff had, that the prosecutor had. Mm -hmm. What was inside that record that would have helped you at trial? Amazingly, there were several things. Uh, the most outlandish was what's been called the monster transcripts. My son was in the house when my wife was murdered. And it basically, it was a recitation of the crime scene and the actual murder from my son's perspective, and the only person he ever told was my mother-in-law. I, I even took him to child psychologists and hoping to, I was very, very afraid that something might have happened to him in the house, or he might have seen something. But he didn't share anything like that with anyone except my mother-in-law, and she told the police, and it's in their files, and they kept it from us. And my, my attorneys always smelled a rat in the case, but they didn't know what the rat was, and they didn't have any mechanism to get it. And 
the law states they're supposed to give up uh, exculpatory evidence, things that make you look good. But at the time, there was no mechanism to force them to do it besides just being good guys. It's a chilling transcript to read because here you have a three-year-old little boy yeah. talking to his grandmother saying, I saw a monster doing something to mommy. What do you feel when you read that? I, I, it, 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 it gets me. Yeah, every parent should. Um, it was very, ch literally chilling um, because I didn't read it until it was out. Oh, is that right? Yeah, the, the Innocence Project, like any good lawyers, they were running a plan B in case the DNA didn't work. They, I mean, nobody knows what's gonna happen until you run the test. And so they basically ran a Freedom of Information Act and they got the files from the prosecutor and the uh, sheriff from 86 and 87, and they found wild stuff in there. Credit card being used after my wife's death, a check, neighbors saying they saw a guy case in our house, parking behind it, walking into the woods, just things we should have had. See, I'm listening to this. What is the incentive for the prosecutor to ignore all that evidence? I mean, he had a guy. It just wasn't you. Why? I know that nags you, too, and I, you probably yeah. don't have the right answer, but... Yeah, I can speculate, and I've been willing to talk to the attorneys, I mean, to the, to the prosecutor. He's just not there, and he's not willing. But um, you can sort of piece it together. I've seen him in court. I see the statements he's made. And uh, the why? And not only was he not disciplined after that, he moved up. He became a judge in the state of Texas. Yeah. It was a high profile case. He was seen as having won a big conviction for himself and he moved up the ladder. Yeah, he- Did that eat at you? He, while I was inside, he actually became, uh, he was awarded an, uh, some plaque that said prosecutor of the year. Mm -hmm. And then he became a state district judge. Um, he was moving up while I was moving down. Um, whether it was all or in part from my situation, we can debate that, but um, he took a very different path than my life took, yeah. But since then, since your innocence has been proven, mm -hmm. things have flipped. You've gone up uh, yeah. and he's gone down. Um, the, the bar, the, the attorneys in Texas are very angry at him and um, They've gone after him in a big way on a multiple levels. They asked me what I wanted. And I told them, I said, well, I understand about statute of limitations, but my main concern is he's no longer practicing law and he's off the bench and he's not doing this to anybody else. And at the end of the day, what happened was he was removed from the bench. He lost his law license. He was given 500 hours community service, $500 fine, and he served about five days in jail. Hmm. Five days. He was sentenced to 10 and he served five. Isn't that right? Yeah. Yeah. There is, we were talking about this backstage. You have to go online and, and check it out. There's a picture of Michael walking out of the courthouse. I think it was October 4th, 2011. Bingo. Uh, that's an important day in your life, I know. And it's just remarkable. And it's you walking out with a big smile on your face and your eyes closed just feeling that sun. Yeah. What was that moment like? Um, it was like a physical manifestation of everything that was happening that day. That, that, it was that little capsule in time. As we were going out the door, uh, my attorney, my friend, uh, he got me a little cue as we were heading towards the door, walking out of the courthouse, and he said, Michael, breathe freedom or something like that. And uh, it's one of those beautiful fall days with the sun shining and I just kind of leaned my head back and closed my eyes and felt the sun and it really felt different. It was free sun, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing how the same sun can feel different on one side of the wall from the other, isn't it? Yes. Um, everything is relative. <laughs> <laughs> now, what, what strikes me is that you, you took what could have been a, a situation that made you angry and resentful mm -hmm. and I'm sure that still lives in, inside you somewhere but you decided I'm gonna use this as a positive now. I need to make sure this doesn't happen to other people. Where did you begin in that mission? It began when uh, one of my attorneys told me something I already knew and I'd read it before. He said, 
harboring this uh, hatred and revenge, all this animus, he said, it's akin to drinking poison and then hoping that guy over there dies from it. Mm. And uh, <laughs> it's apropos because when I consciously decided to forgive everybody that I felt was responsible for my incarceration, and I'm just human, I had plotted their murders. I was going to kill some people when I got out. And uh, when I let all that go, I felt lighter. I felt cleansed. I, uh, I felt 20 or 30 pounds lighter in a, in a kind of a liberating way. And it was, it was just that conscious choice to forgive those guys. And uh, it take a while to get there, though. They took a quarter century of the prime of your life and pried your three-year-old out of your hands. Yeah, it wasn't instantaneous. It's kind of like, uh, <laughs> I mean, everything worthwhile is hard and takes a little bit of time. Uh, this was worthwhile because I've, I've met some other exonerees and guys have just been to prison. And so many of them are bitter and angry. And uh, that's no way to live life. Life's worth living. Get out there and live it. Mm. Yeah. Tell me now about the Michael Morton Act, signed in 2012 in the state of Texas with Governor Rick Perry. Yeah. What does it change about the law? Uh, it gives what they call Brady teeth. Brady was a case, Supreme Court, 1963. You're supposed to give over the stuff that makes you look innocent. A f in Texas, now the prosecutors have to sign a form that goes into the court record. They're going to give you exculpatory evidence before, during, and after the trial. And all that does is make them personally liable that if they do something like they did to me, they will lose their law license and they're looking at 15 years in prison. And no thinking prosecutor, in my mind, would jeopardize his professional career and his life over an iffy case. And that's just going to stop what happened to me from happening to you. Was that a hard law to get through or did you have pretty good support? Because um, I know there's been pushback on it. A little bit. And we're going to be back in Austin this year, uh, next year rather, for the next session. There was some pushback, but um, this is a situation of this, it sailed through. I, I didn't know any better. I, I found out there were people who been working on this for 10 years. But when I got involved and looked the senators in the eye and asked them why, uh, we got through the Senate and the House unanimously. And the governor brought that bill up to the very first one of the sessions to sign it. And um, some defense attorneys think I'm a rock star, but I haven't done anything. And if this is stuff that happened to me, I didn't do it. Well, a lot of people think you are a rock star. I have to ask you before our time runs out here in just a second, um, how your relationship is with your son now? I have a lot of new relationships. Um, since getting out, I've remarried um, Cynthia. Your wife back. Is here? Yes. But the one that people ask about the most, I have so many new relationships with my son, and we went in opposite directions for a good while. He thought I was the uh, monster that killed his mom. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're back, and we're normal now. Um, it was... Um, an organic process rather than a linear one. And we're probably um, in that uncomfortable average zone now where it is, it's not perfect. We're all fathers and sons. Absolutely. Be. The uncomfortable <laughs> average. It means you're doing well. That's what they tell me. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's such an honor to have you here. And thank you for the great work you do in, in turning what could be 25 years of despair into hope for a lot of other people. Michael Morton. Thank you. Thank you.